You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Sed Lewis. Hey parents, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. On today's episode, we talk about how to become a tech entrepreneur, how to build apps, how to build websites. And in order to have this episode, I had to go get a heavyweight. And I enlisted my good friend, Anthony Frazier, who's a digital strategist, a tech entrepreneur, an author, a public speaker. He's also one of the co-founders of the Fat Startup, which is an integrated media company that produces resources for aspiring entrepreneurs. And he's also one of the few people who has created his own conference called Tech 808 that features some of the best minds within the tech field. And he also just released his new book, Don't Dumb Down Your Greatness. So on this episode, Ace and I really get into some very secret sauce of how to build apps and what you need to be in the tech industry. So please get some pen, paper, write these gems down. You're not going to regret it. But before we get into it, a quick word from my sponsor, M-Spot. Parents, M-Spy is the ultimate monitoring tool for all devices. M-Spy remotely tracks GPS locations, calls, texts, messages, WhatsApp, Snapchat, web browsers, pictures, and much more. With M-Spy, you can also restrict unwanted calls, block websites, or even block apps. Go to mspy.com for more information. Hey, Anthony, welcome to the Digital Parent Podcast. We're so happy to have you on our show today. Thank you for inviting me, man. It's a, it's an honor, man. I've been hearing about your podcast for a while now. I know my partner, my former partner James, he was on here, and um, you know, he had a great time. So I'm interested in seeing what we do today. And thing after you have such a unique story, and I think for parents and, and teenagers, you know, it's, it's very vital for us to hear your story. How you start from the bottom, and then you this big wig at the top. So, kind of tell our listeners how did you go from stocking boxes at Kmart? to pitching <laughs> Google in Silicon Valley and becoming this big-time serial entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, it was just all mind state. You know, I think, um, you know, when I was uh, working on that, at that retail job, you know, I just saw the way the, the managers and, you know, the people who were in charge, I just saw how they treated the individuals who were, you know, below them, you know, you know, like myself and some of my coworkers. And I don't know, like I would just look around sometimes and I look at their faces and I just say, man, like they kind of settled, you know, and right. like, like they was content. Like that was, that was their life and there was nothing else. There was nothing more. There was either, you know, work here. If you didn't work here, find another job, you know, like this is the hustle and bustle of like, you know, uh, part-time jobs and the everyday life. And I was just like, yo, I don't don't feel like I belong here. Um, And it was my fault that I was there, you know, because, uh, you know, I wasn't a really good student. I wasn't a really a good student in school. You know, I cut class a lot, played a lot of video games, hung out with friends, um, you know, and just like really just wasn't focused on, getting a better uh, grades in school so that I can go to a good college. You know, it's by the time it was time for me to go to a college, the only college I can go to was a county college. Um, and when I went there, it was cool. Like, I learned a lot, but eventually I lost motivation and I had to drop out. And so it was just, uh, you know, one of those things where, man, you know what, I'm, I want to change my life. And I want to do something different. And so uh, I started a website with a few friends of mine. You know, we since we like playing video games so much, what I would do during the day is work on this gaming site. And, and what we would do is write reviews, um, you know, record podcasts. This is before podcasts really became what they were today. Right. Uh, record podcasts, uh, you know, go to events, you know, with developers and that's what I would do during the day. And then during the night, I would be stocking boxes at Kmart. And one day, you know, I saved up enough money to where I can go to this big gaming conference um, called E3. And I saved up all my money and I quit. I quit that job and I went out to E3. Um, and, and, you know, with just maybe about only $300 in my in my bank account. <laughs> and, and so I was like, yo, I need to land something out here. We I ended up landing a contract 
with a very popular actor. I can't say his name, right? But we we built me and a few friends. We built his website, and we and it, they paid us about ten thousand dollars. Now that that may seem cool if it was just me, but like I said, it was me and a few friends. So that ten thousand went away quickly. You know, it's like, hey man, when well, you got to split it up, it ain't really nothing. And so I ended up just back at square one on my mother's couch. You know. Uh, you know, working on the game site with no job since I left Kmart, you know, since I left that retail job. And so I went online and I started looking at Craigslist and I said, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, uh, try to get into the tech startup, you know, in, in industry. I was watching, I was reading, you know, magazines with Mark Zuckerberg and all these guys. And so I would go to the library every day, look at interviews from tech entrepreneurs it was a site called Mixergy.com. I'm not sure if they're still up, but Mixergy, they had nothing but interviews from like entrepreneurs. And I was like, yo, I'm just going to learn. This is going to be my school. This is going to be my MBA. Right. And I just started going there every day, teach, teaching myself, you know, lightly how to code. And then also uh, watching Mixergy and taking notes and reading, you know, interviews and reading books from like great entrepreneurs. And then eventually an opportunity came up to intern at a startup. They were looking for college interns. And you know me, you knew my situation. I dropped out. And so, but my website was averaging, you know, about 200,000 uniques at the time. And so, and a month, you need, you know, unique hits. And I looked at the site of the startup that was hot, that was hiring for interns. And it was telling me, they was like, hey, look, you know, we, we looking really to get this college student. And be honest with you, we got this young lady. She goes to something, something university. Um, it's either her or you. And I was like, well, you hire her, then you got to tell somebody what to do. You hire me. I could bring your traffic up 100%. And I was like, you know, I, I said, exhibit A, you know, I get more traffic than you right now, <laughs> like on my own. And so, you know, they, I, I kind of presented an undisputable argument and they ended up like hiring us both. And after a month, I ended up, you know, full time as a biz dev associate. Now, 80% of startups fail. Right. And so that startup, even though I just got hired, you know, it was kind of on its last leg and it ended up failing about a year later. And so one of the investors, I pitched him an idea for an app called Played, which is like video games uh, meets Foursquare, you know. And so he wrote me a check on the spot. I flew out to Silicon Valley because I got accepted into an accelerator. And that was, you know, that's how I kind of came from there to there. My mind you, all this happened. Quick question for our listeners: What's a, can you define what an accelerator is for folks who may not know? An accelerator is basically a program, or you know, uh, for that runs usually about three to four months, um, and they kind of help give you mentorship, help your business kind of accelerate, get to the point where you can raise your first round, um, and so they give you some seed money in the beginning of an accelerator, typically. Not all accelerators do that, but typically they give you some seed money and then they run you through um, a, a series of mentorship sessions, learning sessions, all while building your company up so that one day, you know, which would be a demo day at the end of the program, they could present, you know, a, a very viable, uh, investable business that can have other investors jump in on. And so that's really what Accelerator is. And so... Uh, it, it's, it's really, and honestly, it's accelerators are becoming like college where, you know, yeah, you get some money, yeah, you can get some, you know, you get some money, you can learn a few things, but the more, the biggest value in an accelerator is the network that comes along with it. And so like, if you were to get into a, like a wide combinator, uh, yeah, you get some money, you get to, you know, do a lot of different things, but what, what you're really gaining is a huge network of really boss uh, entrepreneurs, really well connected entrepreneurs, really intelligent entrepreneurs and, and, and executives, and just a long, huge network that you're going to be able to build your next business or the current one um, to its greatest ability. So, hey, let's go back through the steps because you make it sound really easy. But what I'm hearing is <laughs> you had this passion for video games, right? You and your homeboys, yeah. your buddies were playing around, you guys had an idea. It said, hey, let's hustle and let's put this idea into fruition. And then you network through your internship to get those connections to get to the accelerators. I didn't hear anything about a business plan. 
any of those things. This was about passion. You know, and saying, hey, let's <laughs> it's go so get funny. it. You know what? It's so funny, yo. Like, cause like I did do like a nice little, I would say, business course that was in Newark for small businesses for people in the community that wanted to learn. And in this program, they taught us, you know, how to write a feasibility plan, how to write a business plan, how to how to uh, you know do all these different things on planning. It was just like a straight planning workshop, like right. just six weeks, six weeks of planning. Then, you know, what was crazy is that. When I first, when I got the internship, I walked into the office and I asked the uh, the founder, and this is a funded company, like they weren't like VC funded, but they had already raised like you know maybe a few hundred thousand dollars to get their business off the ground. And I asked them, I said, "Hey, look, so where's your business plan? I t- I like to take a look at it." And it was like business plan. They looked at me like I said something alien. Right, right. You know, and I was like, "Wait, hold up! I just spent weeks." You know, learning about something that's completely irrelevant in the startup world. You know, like, and I wouldn't say completely irrelevant, but it was like, you know, you didn't need it to get started. And they didn't need it to get money. Right. You know, and so I just felt like, wait, hold up, man. There's two different games being played here. I want to learn how to play the game they're playing. Right. (laughs) So I I think that's interesting for, for parents, for kids. Like, if you have a great idea, if it's the next app or, or whatever the next tech solution is, how do you take it from idea to concept to get to the point where you can pitch? Well, you know, it's it's so many different ways. You know, I use a lot of examples. Um, you know, like I just wrote a book, and one of the examples I use is a young lady named Sheena Allen. And, you know, she never developed an app before her life. She's never, you know, been into tech before her life previously. And so she just was standing in line one day and just said, hey, I hate this experience that I'm having. We need an app to make this better. She went home. She didn't even have no design experience. She used Microsoft Word to literally design her first app. She then went online and hired, like she typed into Google, you know, find a developer or something like that. And she ended up on a a site called guru.com, which is like Elance, where you can find developers for hire and stuff like that. And she basically found a developer and hired him. You know, she saved up some money. You know, I'm not going to make it seem like, you know, she had, you know, she saved up some money and she basically built the first version of the app that she had in her head that she designed on Microsoft Word. So really, you know, I'll I'll say that, but then I'm going to take you to another story where I just interviewed an entrepreneur named Chinadu, you know, and Chinadu is the founder of an app, a little app called Hopstop. Now, Hopstop was his first app as well. And he did it the exact same way. He wasn't a designer. He was just like, you know, I think he worked at JP Morgan or something like that. And he was like, yo, I just want to design this app because, you know, I hate the way subways, you know, I hate the way apps work as far as like learning how to get to place to place in New York City. And so he designed the app. I think he used like something small. I don't even know what it was. It was like Microsoft Word, maybe something a little different, but it was real lightweight. Then he did the same thing Sheena did. He went online. I think he hit hit up, uh, uh, you know, like Elance, found a developer, and got the first version built. So really, it's all about just solving a problem. Like if it, you know, whatever that problem is, figure out how you want to solve it. Then put it on paper, design it, and then find yourself someone to help you build it. And that and and here's the difference between what I think a lot of people who have ideas and a lot of people who really execute on them. When I look at Chinadu, when I look at Sheena, and I look at how they got to where they are, Sheena is like, you know, 4 million downloads already, you know? And so, and Chinadu just sold this company to Apple about a year or two ago. So when you look at these two entrepreneurs, the difference is they put their money where their mouth was. And not every entrepreneur is going to be, you know, every not, I'm just, not every situation is going to require that. But they wanted it so bad that they saved up money. A lot of people say, I'm looking for a developer. I'm looking for a developer. I'll tell you, half the people telling me that are people with jobs. Right. And I'm like, I'm like, wait, you looking for a developer? Why don't you just buy one? Like, if you really like this idea, you really feel like it's going to be the next big thing, you know, save up your money. You know, the thing is, who's willing to sacrifice? 
And I think anybody can get any uh, that idea off the ground. I think, that's, they, a, I think that's a great point. Like a lot of people are looking for investors to invest in their app idea, but not a lot of people want to invest in themselves as far as building up their capital so they get some of their own skin in the game. And, and talk about and how important is that when you're pitching your app idea? Isn't that one of the first questions an investor is going to ask you is how much money you put into your product first? Definitely. I think that's one of the, you know, to me, um, I, yeah, I think what it does is it shows that, hey, this is a person who's going to get it done, whether or not I'm with them, you know, because to me, I feel like that's the best kind of person to be. Like, I want people and I think that's something that, for you know, parents should instill in their children. It's like, you know, you want to kind of be the kind of person who. Uh, you're like, I'm going to get this done whether or not you're with me or not. And that that's what inspires people to be with you. Like, nobody wants to, you know, be a charity. You know, people want to work with people who are going to put in their own work and, 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 pedal the, and pedal the bike alongside with you. You know, um, nobody wants to be, be a person who's carrying. So the, the problem today in tech is a lot of developers... You know, they feel like they're going to carry people or they're working for people. Uh, you know, I hate to use this term, but like a slave like mentality where, hey, you come to me and I'm just going to build this idea for you for free and, you know, and all this stuff. But if you come to me with the app already like a prototype, it don't even have to be a finished app, but it could be a prototype. That's already showing me that, look, this is a person who's going to get this done, whether I'm working with them or not. You, you know, know what, we giving away a lot of secret sauce uh, to parents and to kids of how to really develop your first app. As somebody who developed my own app, it's really not that hard. It's really simple because what you're stating is come up with a problem, solve it, write it out, draw it out. Like you say, you go to work, you can draw a little rectangle of a app or yeah, an app screen. Yeah, this this apps out there like Envision and Balsamic as well, where you can do it too. Yep. Yeah. Put you know, put where you want your buttons, right on the side what you want the app to do, and then go and find somebody on Elance or one of those sites, see how much they're gonna charge you to take your concept and make it a reality. Mm-hmm. And that's just the first version. Like, right. you know, you can work with them to fine tune it, or you can use that to go help you recruit someone. But to me, I think yeah, if you really want to get something off the ground, you can do it. It's just that some people are looking to get something off the ground without putting anything down. And I think that's unrealistic and not practical, especially in 2016, 2017. Like if you really want to get an idea off the ground, it's not and it's not like it costs that much, you know, like to really, you know, there's, it could cost way more. But like to me, in my opinion, I think you should at least budget to like fit, at least budget fifteen hundred dollars to get a first version of an app out. Yeah, I was getting ready to say I've heard anywhere from five hundred to a thousand just to get that first prototype out in a workable yeah. condition. Yeah, I think fifteen hundred is a good like you put you spec out everything, you you put the idea down, you say what you wanted, you say how you want it to work, you know what problem you want to solve, you know, get it done, and then go to the person who, you know, go interview people, have them use it, tell them what they like and dislike about it. You know, figure out what they like and dislike about it. Write it down. Bring those changes back to the table. Make those changes and keep doing it until you get to the point where your app is now just like the thing everyone wants, you know, specifically in your niche. And so I think that's, you know, of course, I'm making it seem I'm saying it at a very high level. You know, I'm making, you know, you said I make it seem easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. But at the same time, it's doable. It's, it's not impossible. Yeah, it's, it's definitely doable. Let's go back to the investment piece because you know a lot of times people want to go to like you know these like Kickstarter pages, you know these crowdfunding pages to raise the money to kickstart their app. All the, all the people you probably interviewed, you know, over your career, how many people have actually started within their family, within their you know their close friends to actually get that money together to start building this prototype? Most of them, okay. you know, most people start there. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, friends and family and friends, you know, that's the first, you know, that's the first round. And so, you know, my mother was my first investor. You know, I say that all the time. And, you know, like, well, she gave you money for your app. Nah, but she fed me. 
She right. gave me a she gave me a she gave me a roof over my head. Right. She put she put me in a in a good school. You know what I mean? Like to me, if I wasn't doing any of those things, I wouldn't even have the creativity to do any of the things I'm doing today. So she was my first investor, and I think yeah, you know, monetarily, uh, you know, they're definitely, um, you know, friends and family rounds that you should explore before going out there. Definitely, you know, but just know the risk. You know, make sure you communicate the risk to your family. Um, and make sure you're being very, I would say, very vocal and very detailed about what it is that they're engaging in. I think, you know, miscommunication could be a big problem when it comes to, you know, dealing with friends and family when it comes to business. And so you just want to make sure you're being as transparent as possible if you're doing those things. You know, one of the things I want to switch to, because there seemed to be this um, transition in the African-American community of really pushing kids to go into STEM, which is great. And you've seen a lot of code academies pop up, like, you know, Black Girls Code. There's, you know, Black Men Code. Do you think it's, it's worth the time? Because it seems like we're teaching our kids to be the coders and to be the workers opposed mm-hmm. to the people who actually hire the workers. You know, mm-hmm. should they do it the way that you kind of did it was, you know, come up with the idea, come up with the concept, be the brains behind the operations, or should they be the person who's learning to code like all those very technical things that go with, you know, with apps and go that route. Yeah. I mean, I think honestly, uh, you know, we, we do have to make sure that we're workforce ready. You know, I'm on, I'm on both sides of the argument, you know, and because right now that's the, you know, when we look at the 21st, you know, we look at the next century, we look at the next 20 years, all of the jobs, all of the jobs are going to be mostly digital by the year 2020. Right. In year 2040. You know, when you think about 2020, you think about 2040. And so if we're not workforce ready, if your, ki- if your children aren't workforce ready, it's going to be a big problem. And so, yeah, we have to make sure that, you know, our young people are digitally literate and computer science literate because that's where the most fruitful and rewarding careers are going to be based And so I do agree with that. Now, I also agree that, yeah, while we're doing that, we should be teaching our, you know, young people to be bosses, too. You know, we should be teaching our young people to, uh, you know, think for their own and learn how to solve problems creatively um, and build, you know, and learn how to create solutions to those problems. Because that's what entrepreneurship is all about. Just creating solutions. You know, you don't even have to call it entrepreneurship in a sense, when you're teaching your young people, you can just say, hey, look, we want to be problem solvers, you know, and as long as you're teaching, you're teaching a young person to be a problem solver, you're definitely preparing them to be an entrepreneur. So one of the things I like about your book, you know, don't dumb down your greatness is, you know, you don't give a lot of like, you know, how to's and technical tips, but you talk about the process and the process that you went through of how to network and how it feels to be rejected. You know, why did you think it was really important to write that type of book, kind of like a motivational book for kids or or young people who are going to go into this tech scene? Uh, Yeah, because I feel like, you know, you want to find out a lot of these tips. There's so many sites now. Like, there's so many articles online. There's so many sites. There's so many resources that a young person can look up and Google how to do this, how to do that, right? But there's not a lot of people really talking about I would say personal development. And right. to me, personal development is, is it, it's basically, it goes side by side with business development. You know, what I've learned, I, you know, it, it opened my mind. I saw this guy named Vishal Lacchione. And I think I talk about this in my book where he talked about, he, he showed a chart on the stage. And on the chart, he showed like his business going up, you know, but then next to it, he showed his personal development, like his life going up as well. He said, and as I became a better person, a better lit, you know, I lived better. I ate better. I sleep better. I meditated. I was great. I was grateful for showing gratitude. Like all the things that just makes you personally develop into a great person. Um, that's when his business started to get better too. So his personal development was the catalyst for his personal success. And so I think that, you know, when we teach young people, uh, the tools on just being personally, you know, uh, you know, developing themselves personally. I think everything else will fall into place. 
and you know what? I think there's a good parallel to hip hop because I was listening to Andre Harrell on the Breakfast Club the other day. And, you know, Andre is a big time producer in the hip hop you know arena, and he talked about a lack of personal development with hip hop artists. Like you got a mm. lot of artists who have a large YouTube following, large social media following, and they're putting out mixtapes, and you know they're getting money off of it. In other words, you know people promoter, promoters are hiring them to do shows. But they don't have like their personal development of like stage presence mm-hmm. or how to dance or you know how to interact with the crowd, and it seems like it's the same thing on the tech side. Like you may have somebody to have the hustle to go out and develop their own app or put their own tech product out, but like do they have the skill set of what you're talking about of how to talk to other business people, how to network when they get in certain arenas, you know, how to communicate. Those essential program, I mean, personal development skill sets that will really take them real far, you know, within the industry. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's why, you know, I consider myself a stoic, right? Right. And being a stoic means that, you know, you view good times and bad times in the same light. And one of the the keys to I think personally developing yourself is finding the good in every situation. And I think that when I look at all the things that I've learned and I wrote about in the book, they only came from mistakes being made. They only came from like failures being you know made and me just going out there and taking the scars, getting, getting hit, you know, and because I got hit, I learned from that and I wrote it down. And so now it's a good thing. <laughs> and I think that, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of young people, you know, we're, we're being conditioned to look at the, the glamorous, right? We're li- you know, you look at Instagram, you see the Grammys, glamorous life. Right. You know, you see these entrepreneurs, you see rappers, you see them living a the glamorous life. But the moment we get hit, whole snap, we don't know how to react to it. You know, like we just react in all kinds of silly ways. And I think that's that's part of personal development I mean, is knowing how to react because action is going to happen. But reaction is going to happen as well. And reaction is a lot more important in some cases than the initial action. And so I think that, you know, we don't learn how to react. We just learn how to act. And I think that. Uh, that's what a, a huge part of a personal development can help someone, you know, succeed. And I think it's excellent for you to be the person to write this type of book from, you know, your app company play to, you know, your media company, the fact startup to like the only, you know, tech com- a tech conference, you know, tech 808 that really talk to minority young folks who want to be in this industry. I'm pretty sure you had a lot of bumps and bruises, they gave you perspective on how to help like young people who are following your path. Yeah, I learned a lot. You know, most of our you know audience was young black women and young black men, um, but then even even other races. You know, we had a lot of Asian, um, you know, a lot of Latino, a lot of you know uh, even Caucasian male and females as well. Uh, but mostly our audience was definitely African Americans, young black African Americans, and so. Uh, it was just something I just pressing on me, you know, it was something I wish I, you know, someone told me, rewrite the book you wish you read. Right. And, and I was like, man, I wish I would have read this. Like all the things that I put in there. And I, uh, of course, I'm going to come out with a new version with more in there soon. But all the things that I put in there um, are things that, yo, I wish I read. Like if someone had told, if someone would have told me a lot of these things early on, I would be so grateful um, and so, 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 you know, appreciative of that person. But I just never got that. You know, I had to learn a lot of things the hard way. And, you know, I'm 30 years old now. Man. You know, I just turned 30 this year. And, you know, I look back and I'm like, you know, I don't regret a thing. But at the same time, it's like, man, these are the things I wished someone would have told me. Who knows where I would be if I had known these things a lot sooner than later. And so... I'm really wanting young entrepreneurs to soak it in uh, for that reason, because who knows what lines they'll be able to skip and don't just read my book. Right. You know, I, I, don't get me wrong. I love my book, right, but, right. but at the same time, reading in general, like I know it sounds very PSA, like, 
But it's true. Reading will help you skip the line. I always say, read. You know, books are the cheat code to life. You know, um, if, you know, reading a book can help you get out of a situation before it even starts. You know, and, and that's just gold. You can't ignore it. So going back to your book, what would be some like two or three key takeaways for teenagers that are reading your book who want to get started in the tech field? I mean, you know, so it's patience. I think one thing like we talked about earlier is that a lot of young people um, just aren't patient, right? Like they look at Instagram, they see all these people with instant success. Well, it's perceived, perceived, instant, right. <laughs> perceived instant success. And they think that the moment they get an idea or the moment they put out a, a, a song on SoundCloud, <laughs> that they're going to get that kind of, you know, uh, success as well. And so what happens is they just, you know, end up failing or they just give up entirely and they don't know how to, pers- they don't know how to persist. And so I think that being patient is great and learning how to think through patience, like thinking A to B instead of A to Z is a key um, for young people, especially today. The other thing I would I would say is just learning how to deal with self-doubt, um, because I think self-doubt is, you know, right now, uh, especially in the tech field, you don't see a lot of people that look like me or you. Right. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in most industries of success, most success, you don't even you know think about, you know, people of color uh, being successful outside of music and entertainment. And so I think that when we start to explore those career paths or, you know, those possibilities of success that doesn't exist in the typical fields, there could be a lot of self-doubt that can just, you know, permeate, you know, a young person's mind. They can is, do I belong here? Um, should I even be in this classroom? Let's say they get into a good college, you know, and they're, they're the only black person in the room. It might make them self-doubt, like, am I even smart enough to be here? Uh, so, like, dealing with self-doubt, I think, is a, a big key. And, and everybody has a little bit of self-doubt. You know, even if you're the most confident person in the world, I believe you still have, like, at least 1% of self-doubt. And, you know, and so, like, how do you deal with that as a young person? And I think the third person, the third takeaway, I would say, is, um, you know, creating your own luck. Right. You know, um, I think that, you know, that's the first chapter in, in the book, actually, uh, where I talk about how I was able to, you know, be a bene- you know, benefactor of circumstances. You know, when I told my story earlier, it was just really just each situation next to each other me leveraging one situation going to the next like leverage is key leverage is the magic that you know brings you to the next step in life and so how do you use whatever experience that you're going through right now to take you to the next level and so i think i i love to just sit back and think about the position that i'm in and how it can get me where i would love to be you know and no matter who you are and what you're doing, you do have a situation. You do have something that can take you to the next level. You just got to figure out what that is. And so you got to create your luck. And the only way to create your luck is to stay prepared. That, that means reading books, taking information as much as possible, studying, getting your mind right, being creative, meditating, um, and being optimistic. And then also when you do all of those things, when the opportunity comes, you'll get lucky. And I think that that's um, that's why those are the three takeaways. Well, hey, Anthony, we really appreciate you being on the show. We really thank you for writing this book because I think it's such a great motivational book for kids or for young millennials who are trying to get into the tech field. Because like you said, there's millions of websites, articles that will give you the know-how. But when you need something that's going to help you deal with that self-doubt when you hit that wall. And I think your book is perfect to pick people yeah. up and motivate people to finish. Yeah, because, you know, the thing is, man, I'll tell you this, too, man. The thing is, there's a lot of successful dummies. I'm going to be honest with you, right? That's what So <laughs> That's what it's a, it's a lot of successful dummies. There's one running for president right now, right? right? And so that's why I say it's a lot of business tips out here. You just need to develop yourself personally and make sure that, yo, you're doing the right things to become successful on a personal tip. Because as you do that, that's when you'll start to see the business success coincide with it. So, like... It's, to me, I think if you work on that, a lot of other things will fall in place, definitely. So, Anthony, where can people uh, find you? How can they contact you? How can they follow you in your career? 
Uh, and you know, the best way is anthonyfraser.com. You can also follow me on Instagram, Anthony Frazier, and on Twitter, Anthony Frazier. And spell my name F R A S I E R, not Z. F R A S I E R. All right, Anthony, thanks for being on the show and good luck to you in the future. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you inviting me, man, and all the parents out there. Uh, you know, I tip my hat to you. You know, I, w- I can't wait to become. I'm not a parent myself, but I can't wait to have you know my kid and be able to you know uh, give him hopefully these gems or her these gems that you know I'm passing on as well. Definitely. Hey, what a great episode with Anthony Frazier. He really provided a lot of secret tips on how to develop app prototypes and how to raise money for development. Make sure you go get his book, Don't Dumb Down Your Greatness. The Amazon link is provided in the show notes. And please, please, please go to iTunes and rate the Digital Parent Podcast. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you thought about this episode. Until the next time.